Hey class, I'm Mr Thornton and I'm going to help you succeed in your GCSEs and IGCSEs. This lesson, Ohm's Law and Electrical Power. In this video, I'm going to be assuming you've already watched my previous video on resistance. You can click here to watch it if you haven't seen it yet. I'm also going to focus particularly on the way we can describe and understand circuit behaviour mathematically. So you should make sure you're also comfortable rearranging simple algebraic equations. Again, if you're not, please see my video on this by clicking just here. Both of these links will also be down in the description. One of the most important equations for describing circuit behaviour is Ohm's law, which is usually stated as V equals I times R, or just V equals IR. V, the potential difference across a component in volts, is equal to I, the current through the component in amperes, which we usually just shorten to amps, multiplied by R, the resistance of that component in ohms, for which we use the Greek symbol omega, remember. Being able to measure the resistance of a component is, of course, something we want to be able to do. Resistors wouldn't be very useful to us if we didn't know exactly what their resistance was. The resistance depends on a range of different properties though. The resistivity of whatever the material is, the length, the width, the height of the resistor, the temperature and so on. This makes it difficult to calculate the resistance from these properties. So instead we can use Ohm's law to find the resistance. If we take V equals IR, we can rearrange it to find R. Remember, put a line on both sides of the equation, then if you want to move something across the equal sign, you also need to move it across the line, like this. This leaves us with V over I equals R, that is V divided by I equals R. Some specifications actually introduce Ohm's law in this form, as R equals V slash I, or R equals V over I. It all means the same thing. The resistance is equal to the voltage divided by the current, or the potential difference divided by the current. So this means that if we know the potential difference across the resistor, and we know what the current through the resistor is, then we can divide that potential difference by the current to get the resistance. We can divide V by I to get R. It's easy to get values for V and I. First we build a circuit with just a power supply like this and the resistor we're interested in. So a really simple circuit. We then measure the current through the resistor with an ammeter in series. Remember, the current will be the same all the way round this loop, so we could put the ammeter anywhere around here. To avoid confusion in more complex circuits though, it's best to put it right before or right after the component you're interested in. The reading on the ammeter will give us our value for I. We also need to add a voltmeter to measure the potential difference. Remember, the voltmeter compares the amount of potential energy between two points, so it needs to be connected in parallel from one side of the component to the other. In a simple circuit like this, we could connect the voltmeter in any of these places. But again, placing its connections right before and right after the component reduces the chances of getting things wrong in a more complex circuit. Let's say that we got a value for V of 15 volts and a value for I of 3 amps when we set this up. We now put these values into our equation. R equals V over I, so R equals 15 volts divided by 3 amps, giving us a value for the resistance of 5 ohms. That's really all there is to measuring resistance. Some of you may also have used a multimeter with a built-in resistance meter, but if you took it apart and examined it, you'd find that there was this same exact circuit inside. The meter measures both the current and the potential difference, and then does the calculation for us, but it's essentially working in the exact same way. So let's look at a more complex example combining two different techniques. Here's a pair of resistors with an equivalent resistance of 12 kilo ohms. Remember that equivalent resistance just means overall resistance. For two resistors in series like this, it's just the sum of their values. Also remember that kilo means thousand, so 12 kilo ohms is 12,000 ohms. I'm using this value because in real world electronics, resistances in kilo ohms and mega ohms, and mega ohms would of course be millions of ohms, resistances in these sorts of values are very common. Now let's imagine that the current through this circuit is 6 milliamps. Remember that a milliamp is one thousandth of an amp, so 6 milliamps would be 6 
thousandths of an amp. And we'll say that the potential difference across the resistor here is 30 volts. What is the resistance of the other resistor? This looks a pretty intimidating problem, I know, but it's really simple. You've already got all the pieces, you just need to put them together. First, let's use the potential difference in current we have to find the resistance of resistor 1. R equals V over I. So the resistance equals 30 volts divided by 6 milliamps. This gives us an answer of 5 kilo ohms, which is what the resistance is for resistance 1. So, pretty simple, we were just using Ohm's law there and our two values to find the resistance of this first resistor. If you're not sure where to start, look at the numbers which you're given and think about things which you could do with them and it may well show you the sort of direction you need to be going with the rest of your calculation. The equivalent resistance, that's the overall resistance remember, was 12 kilo ohms. So if resistor 1 is 5 kilo ohms, then resistor 2 must be the 12 kilo ohms minus the 5 kilo ohms. It must be 7 kilo ohms to make the total up to our 12 kilo ohms. It's that easy. Since the current through resistor 1 must be the same as through resistor 2 because they're in series, we could even calculate the potential difference across resistor 2 using V equals IR if we really wanted to. Just like with all these kinds of physics questions, just take it one step at a time. Stay calm and you will get the answer in the end. That's really as tough as Ohm's law gets. There's not that much to it. So practice some different examples, but you should find it fairly straightforward. Once you know the equation and you know how to put the numbers in your calculator, there's not much more to know. So let's move on and consider power. Power is a measure of how much energy an object uses per second. So, for example, a 100 watt light bulb uses 100 joules of energy every single second. There's an easy way to work out the power in electrical circuits. We use the equation P equals I times V, or P equals IV. That is the power P in watts equals the current in amps multiplied by the potential difference in volts. Again, we could rearrange this equation, so given any two of these values, we can calculate the third one. What's really neat, though, is that we can combine this with Ohm's law. P equals I multiplied by V. But we already know that V, from Ohm's law, is equal to I multiplied by R. What we can do is substitute I multiplied by R into our first equation, P equals I times V, where the V is. This gives us P equals I multiplied by I multiplied by R in these brackets. Multiplying out these brackets gives us P equals I multiplied by I multiplied by R, or we could just write that as P equals I squared R. We've now expressed power in terms of the current we put through a component and in terms of its resistance. To illustrate why this is useful, I want you to think about a power line. As electricity flows along it, the resistance of the line is going to cause some power to be wasted, mainly by heating the wires. Let's imagine it has a resistance of half an ohm per kilometer. So a 100 kilometer line has a total resistance of 50 ohms, which is a fairly typical value for a high voltage distribution system. The only practical ways that you can change that resistance are by making the power line out of a better conductor, which would be more expensive, making it with a greater diameter, which will be more expensive and heavier, or making it shorter, which would require your power station to be closer to wherever you're sending the power. I should add at this point that I am oversimplifying the resistance of the power line somewhat, just in case there's any National Grid engineers watching this. So essentially, we can't do anything about the resistance of the line, at least nothing which is really practical. So let's look at the current instead. Let's imagine we're sending a current of 2000 amps down this power line. As we've seen, power equals the current squared multiplied by the resistance. This will give us the amount of power which is being wasted by the power line before it even gets to where we're sending it. That's energy which is being wasted getting through that resistance of the power line. So I, the current, equals 2000 amps and R equals 50 ohms, so P equals the square of 2000 multiplied by 50, which is equal to 4 million multiplied by 50 ohms. 
giving us 200 million watts. That is a 200 megawatt amount of power which is being wasted. That is a lot of waste power and we'd like to reduce it. As we've seen, we can't easily change the resistance, but what if we could somehow halve the current? If we try our calculation with a current of 1000 amps instead of 2000 amps, it gives us just 50 million watts or 50 megawatts being wasted. By using half the current, we reduce our waste power to a quarter of its original amount. This is because it depends upon the square of the current, so a small change can have a big effect. If we reduced the current to a third of its value, we'd get one ninth of the power wasted. Reduce it to a quarter and we get one sixteenth of the waste and so on. But how can we reduce the current while still ensuring we transmit the same amount of power to the customers at the other end of the power line? Well, it comes back to P equals IV. Energy is conserved. You get the same amount of energy out of a system as you put into a system. All that we can do is change the type of energy. Power is just energy per second and so power is conserved as well. If we put 360 gigawatts, that is 360 billion watts, into our system, we're going to get 360 gigawatts back out of it. Maybe not all of it is going to be in the form we want, but every single one of those watts of power will be released in one way or another. P equals I multiplied by V. So look at these possible combinations of I and V, which give us 360. The key thing to notice here is that as the potential difference V increases, the current I decreases. This is exactly what we want. Doubling the potential difference which we transmit electricity at will halve the current which will reduce the waste energy to a quarter of what it was originally. This is why we transmit at such high voltages. The system is much more efficient far less energy is wasted and so we save money and use less resources and reduce the environmental impact of power generation. If you're wondering how we increase the voltage, we use a step-up transformer. Please check my video on transformers here to learn more about how they work. So, through using V equals IR to find resistance, P equals IV to understand the power, and the principle of conservation of power and substituting the first equation into the second one to get P equals I squared R, we can see why we transmit electricity at such high potentials, typically hundreds of thousands of volts. There's a lot of steps in there, but you just need to understand the individual parts. Any exam question would lead you through these stages, so don't worry, it won't be too tough when you sit down to do these questions. I hope that video really helped you. If it did, it'd be great if you let me know in the comments. Remember to like, subscribe, and hit the bell to get a notification the next time I upload a video. If you check the description, I've got links to my revision guides, to SnapQuiz, that's my revision website and app, and to SucceedSchool.com. That's my website with full lesson plans, schemes of work, and end of unit tests for both teachers and students. I've also got links in the description to my Twitter, my Instagram, my Patreon if you want to support the channel, and there's links to my other YouTube channels Not School and Not School Plays. You can also click just here to subscribe to this channel, and you can click here to check out this related video. Good luck in your GCSEs and IGCSEs, and thanks very much for watching.